Most of us are eagerly waiting for the fourth flight of the starship, and finally there is some good news. As you all know, even though the rocket has been ready for months, it can't launch without the FAA's approval. This is why all eyes have been on the FAA for months, and they have finally made a statement. We're going to talk about it in this video. Before we delve any deeper, please make sure to subscribe to our channel for future updates about Starship and SpaceX's other groundbreaking achievements. Whenever SpaceX approaches its launch schedule, all eyes turn to the FAA. In the past, there have been times when SpaceX was ready to launch for months, but due to the FAA not granting the necessary license, the launch was delayed significantly. The first Starship launch is a good example of this. However, Musk realized that reaching his ambitious goal of 1,000 launches per year would be impossible under such strict regulations. In response, SpaceX, along with a few other space companies, took their concerns to senators, asking for a faster and efficient approval process. The FAA has since improved its process, and as a result, the licensing for the third Starship launch was significantly faster. Now, they have just released a crucial update about the next flight approval process, bringing SpaceX closer to liftoff. Recently, Musk announced that they are targeting early June for the next Starship launch, specifically aiming for June 5th. The FAA has now confirmed that Flight 4 is nearly ready for this early June launch window. The FAA's recent update brings some exciting news. After an extensive review, they have determined that no public safety issues were involved in the anomaly during SpaceX's third Starship launch on March 14th. This crucial finding means that the Starship vehicle is cleared to resume flight operations even as the investigation into the incident continues. To obtain a launch license, SpaceX usually must meet two critical criteria, ensuring public safety standards and completing the investigation of any previous flight mishaps. Interestingly, for Flight 4, the FAA has indicated that SpaceX only needs to satisfy the public safety standards requirement. This means that as long as SpaceX meets these standards, the launch can proceed even with the investigation into the third flight's anomaly still ongoing. This indicates that the license for SpaceX's fourth Starship flight is likely to be granted in early June. Based on previous experiences, I estimate that the license might be issued on June 4th. The FAA typically grants these licenses just hours before the flight, as was the case with Flight 3. Some of you might be wondering why Starship has to go through such a time-consuming approval process, while SpaceX's other rockets, like the Falcon 9, seem to launch almost weekly without any issues. The primary reason lies in the differences between the two vehicles. Falcon 9 is a well-established and extensively tested rocket with a proven track record of successful launches. Over time, the FAA has become familiar with its systems, allowing for a more streamlined approval process. Starship, on the other hand, is a new and highly ambitious vehicle with capabilities that far exceed those of Falcon 9. The Starship is much larger and more powerful, designed to carry up to 100 tons of cargo or passengers to Mars and beyond. Whereas the Falcon 9 is smaller, primarily used for satellite deployments and resupply missions to the International Space Station. Additionally, while Falcon 9 is partially reusable, with its first stage capable of landing and being reused multiple times, Starship aims to be fully reusable. This means both the Super Heavy Booster and the Starship vehicle itself are designed to be recovered and reused. While safety is crucial, these strict regulations can sometimes slow down progress. I don't think legendary rockets like those used in the Apollo missions would have succeeded if they had faced such strict regulations back then. The good news is that the FAA is working on giving SpaceX a portfolio of launch licenses. What this means is that SpaceX could receive approvals for multiple launches at once, rather than needing a separate license for each flight. This new approach would significantly cut down on the red tape and allow SpaceX to ramp up its launch schedule. In addition to the approval process updates, the launch date is nearly set. Cameron County recently announced 14-hour road closures around the expected launch date. The primary launch date is June 5th, with backup dates on June 6th and 7th. What's going to make this launch different from the previous three is the use of a virtual launch tower for landing. 
This means SpaceX will simulate a virtual tower to calculate how both the tower and the rocket will perform, as if they were using the actual mechanical tower in real life. This simulation helps them understand the potential outcomes, and if the results are positive, they might use the actual launch tower for the next fifth flight. Despite plans for a virtual tower-assisted landing, the booster will land in the Gulf of Mexico, likely near the center of the Gulf. For the ship, the splashdown area is in the eastern Indian Ocean, near Western Australia and South Indonesia. The FAA also added a new area in the Western Indian Ocean, southeast of Madagascar Island. With everything almost ready, the countdown for Flight 4 begins. During this waiting period, SpaceX also tested its water deluge system, which involves a mega steel pancake design that sprays water to absorb the immense heat and force from the rocket's engines during launch. This system aims to prevent damage to the launch pad by reducing the impact of the rocket's exhaust. In other exciting news, the highly anticipated Dream Chaser space plane is finally about to launch after years of preparation. Have you ever wondered how these types of space projects get off the ground? Let's break it down. Space companies come up with innovative ideas for spacecraft, and then they pitch these ideas to NASA. If NASA sees potential in the project, they invest in it to help bring the concept to life. For example, NASA has invested in several notable projects over the years. They backed SpaceX's Dragon capsule with around $396 million to develop a spacecraft for cargo and crew transport. Blue Origin received about $500 million to develop their New Shepard and New Glenn rockets. Boeing Starliner, another spacecraft designed to carry astronauts, was supported with approximately $4.2 billion. But why does NASA do this? By investing in multiple companies, NASA ensures that there are several viable options for getting cargo and crew to the International Space Station and beyond. This not only drives technological advancements, but also helps to keep costs down. In the past, NASA used to handle all of these missions themselves. They developed and operated the Space Shuttle program, which was a fleet of reusable space planes that carried astronauts and cargo to and from the International Space Station. The Space Shuttle program was incredibly successful, but also very expensive and complex to maintain. After the Space Shuttle retired in 2011, NASA needed new ways to continue their missions. Instead of building a new space plane from scratch, NASA decided to partner with private companies. This approach allows NASA to leverage the creativity and efficiency of the private sector while focusing on projects like the Artemis program, which aims to return humans to the moon and eventually send astronauts to Mars. Out of all the projects that NASA is funding, Dream Chaser stands out as the most unique. But what exactly makes it so special? First, Dream Chaser is designed to be reusable. Unlike traditional capsules that land in the ocean or on hard ground, Dream Chaser can land on a runway, just like an airplane. Dream Chaser is a space plane, which means it combines elements of a traditional aircraft and a spacecraft. It has wings and can glide back to Earth, providing a smoother and more controlled landing. Additionally, Dream Chaser has been designed to dock with the International Space Station autonomously. This means it can approach and attach to the International Space Station without the need for manual intervention from astronauts. This is very important because we've seen many spacecrafts fly all the way to the International Space Station and then return to Earth without docking due to the challenges of manual docking. Boeing Starliner is a good example of this issue as it experienced problems that prevented it from docking with the International Space Station during its initial test flight. Of course, all these capabilities of the Dream Chaser are just on paper for now. But after years of preparation, the Dream Chaser is finally ready to show us what it can do. More than six months ago, in late October and early November of 2023, Sierra Space announced they had completed the first Dream Chaser prototype, Tenacity. At that time, they revealed that Dream Chaser would undergo several months of testing at NASA's Neil Armstrong Test Facility. After completing these tests, the space plane would move to Florida to get ready for its first launch. After many months of rigorous testing, on May 20th, NASA officially announced on its website that the Dream Chaser had arrived at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. 
This milestone was part of NASA's broader efforts to expand commercial resupply capabilities in low Earth orbit. The Dream Chaser spaceplane, aptly named Tenacity, arrived at Kennedy on May 18th. It was transported in a climate-controlled container from NASA's Neil Armstrong Test Facility in Sandusky, Ohio. It's worth noting that Sandusky, Ohio, is also famous for its roller coasters at Cedar Point, which might be fun but has nothing to do with space travel. Upon arrival at the launch complex, Dream Chaser joined its companion, the Shooting Star Cargo Module, which had arrived on May 11th. This step was crucial as it marked the final preparations before the space plane's launch. According to NASA, after arriving at the launch site, teams moved Dream Chaser Tenacity to the high bay inside the space system's processing facility for final testing and pre-launch processing. Regarding pre-launch testing and processing, Dream Chaser will undergo a series of additional tests, such as acoustic and electromagnetic interference compatibility testing. The team will also complete work on the space plane's thermal protection system and finalize payload integration. Dream Chaser has already gone through many rigorous tests during its more than six months at NASA's test facility. The space plane and the cargo module underwent vibration testing using the world's most powerful spacecraft shaker system at NASA's Space Environments Complex. Following this, Dream Chaser underwent over five weeks of thermal testing at NASA's In Space Propulsion Facility. During these tests, Dream Chaser and Shooting Star were subjected to multiple cold and hot cycles in a vacuum environment, with temperatures ranging from minus 150 to over 250 degrees Fahrenheit. This allowed Sierra Space to conduct functional tests at these extreme temperatures to verify system performance. One critical system that underwent thorough testing was the space plane's forward RCS thruster. This component, located at the front of the space plane and covered by the thermal protection system carrier plate, is crucial for Dream Chaser's docking with the space station. It will also endure the highest temperatures during re-entry. The tests were completed without issues, indicating that the system performed well and is ready for the demands of space missions. Now, let's talk about the launch schedule. According to NASA, the launch is set for later this year. Dream Chaser will be launched by ULA's Vulcan rocket from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. It will deliver 7,800 pounds of cargo to the International Space Station. This means cargo will be loaded onto both the space plane and the cargo module. Dream Chaser Tenacity's first mission will last 45 days. NASA and Dream Chaser will undertake several critical steps once the space plane enters orbit. These steps include approaching the space station and performing demonstrations of altitude control, translational maneuvers, and abort capabilities. After these demonstrations, space station astronauts will use the robotic arm to grapple and dock the spacecraft to an Earth-facing port. Upon mission completion, Dream Chaser will undock from the station and return to land at Kennedy's launch and landing facility, with its 30-foot length and 15-foot wingspan, coupled with unique wings and a heat shield system, Dream Chaser can land on a runway similar to NASA's Space Shuttle. This capability is not only a nod to the legacy of the Space Shuttle, but also a significant advancement in space plane technology, allowing for more flexible and controlled landings. The successful completion of the upcoming launch will be significant milestones for both Sierra Space and NASA. And that's all for today's update. If you enjoyed watching and found it useful, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the like button. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.